My name is uh, Dr. Army Harper, and um, I'm really grateful to Orbis um, for allowing me to talk to you all today. Um, everything in here is my opinion and how I treat babies on a daily basis. Um, I'm in uh, Texas, and I'm associated with two University of Texas universities. Um, if you have any questions, we have a question and answer session at the end. In addition, my email will be at the end. You're always welcome to email me. So we'll get started. Let's see. Let's see who we are. So uh, when we talk about ROP, it's the leading cause now of childhood blindness throughout the world. There are approximately 50,000 babies in the world currently blind as a result of ROP. Even in the U.S., we still have about 600 babies that go blind every year. This is a largely preventable problem with a combination of properly monitored oxygen supplementation um, and then systemic disease prevention and appropriate treatment once the type 1 ROP uh, begins. We've been doing this for quite a while. We also have a small um, nonprofit, and we want to thank our global partners, um, and you can see those listed there. We're also really grateful to Project Orbis for allowing us to give us the opportunity to share the information with the world. We are committed to being the voice for every premature infant to give them the likelihood of experiencing a full and healthy life. So I am a consultant for Regeneron, and I will be talking about uh, off-label drug use, uh, bevacizumab and then ranibizumab in the U.S. It's approved by the FDA, I mean, the uh, European equivalent of the FDA in Europe, the ranibizumab is. So there's a, current, a couple different types of treatment modalities for ROP worldwide. And as you all know, cryotherapy was originally used, started in Japan, pioneered by Earl Palmer at the University of Oregon, and subsequently was fairly effective. Um, after that, laser kind of took over ROP and still an excellent treatment for type 1 ROP. Now we do things a little differently. Again, laser can be used and is super effective in the right hands. Um, we also use anti-VEGF therapy now. Anti-VEGF therapy, there are many different drugs now that can be used for anti-VEGF therapy, but the two um, that we'll talk about today are bevacizumab and ranibizumab. In addition, some people use anti-VEGF therapy plus laser, either concurrently, which means at the same time, or later, and I'll discuss that because that's basically what we do. So with uh, diode laser photocoagulation, we use the red diode laser. We treat the avascular retina in a very dense pattern, almost confluent. Um, the success rate of this in the right hands is excellent. Again, uh, in this study in 2000, 0% uh, of zone one eyes progressed and only 3.8 um, in zone two eyes had a recurrence. Um, this is an example of a type 1 ROP before laser, and you can see the vascular tortuosity and then the ridge of uh, stage 3 in a vascular retina. I put the picture in the right in there because the baby nutritionally was doing very poorly and had two uh, broken femurs as well, secondary to nutrition. And that, of course, goes along with retinopathy of prematurity is the nutritional aspect of things. So for type 1 ROP, this is two-week status post-laser. You can see the beginning regression of uh, the stage 3 uh, ridges, and then you see the vascular tortuosity regressing. It is not unusual to have a little hemorrhage at the edge after laser, and that occurs quite commonly also with the antivitreal anti-VEGF treatments. So the problem with laser is it's very time-consuming. It's difficult, requires mentor training in the future after this is accomplished, you're destroying a vascular retina. So you do have some decreased peripheral vision, um, decreased night vision, high myopia because of the anterior segment um, being a little bit deeper and having a different shape. And most people use general anesthesia um, because the babies move around a lot. And it's a little safer if you can control the airway, in my opinion. But um, it does work well. This is one of my patients, now 17 years old, this point that was injected at 35 weeks postmenstrual age. Currently, the vision is 2020. Um, so you can see they can do quite well with this type of laser for a type 1 retinopathy of prematurity. 
But, and this is what I always talk about with my residents, we, would, we want to visualize the perfect drug for type 1 ROP. Um, we want a drug that's immediately effective for the cessation or stopping of the type 1 ROP. We want rapid dissolution from the systemic circulation. Uh, we don't want a drug that has systemic side effects. We want normal VEGF levels to occur because they're essential for neurogenesis and also development of any, almost any organ in the body. So we need normal levels of serum VEGF. We want the normal vasculature to grow. In other words, when you apply a dose of intravitreal anti-VEGF, regular vasculature in the retina stops growing for a while too. And we want that to continue on if possible. And we don't want uh, abnormalities of normal macular vasculature. There's some excellent articles now um, out of Duke which talk about um, the um, evidence that uh, the, the uh, macular, they talk about OCT changes after intravitreal anti-VEGF and something always to look at. So, so far we don't have this drug. There are two common drugs that are, we use in ROP, bevacizumab and ranibizumab. Bevacizumab, a vastin, obviously is much less expensive, um, was developed as an anti-cancer drug and has been used for years and years for macular generation, other vascular diseases of the retina. Ranibizumab is a smaller molecule and we'll talk about that. It was developed specifically for the eye. FDA approved for use in adults in, um, in the US uh, and in Europe for, um, uh, for babies. So the basic biochemistry of angiogenesis, I know you all know this, but I thought I'd go over it very quickly. Angiogenesis is the growth of new blood vessels. It plays a normal, a role in normal development and maintenance of the vasculature. And then abnormal angiogenesis is implicated in a number of diseases, including proliferative retinopathies, and that includes diabetes, macrogeneration, branch retinal vein occlusions, and of course, ROP. VEGF-A was the is one of the prime drivers. It's a powerful stimulator of angiogenesis. Um, it is secreted by a number of cells, including endothelial cells. It's a homodimeric protein. And VEGF-A is a key mediator of angiogenesis and vascular leakage. It binds and then it has signal transduction, gene expression, and you can get the vascular leakage and angiogenesis. So this is something we don't want. We want to end up blocking this particular uh, protein. So when we talk about drug design, we want a really a drug that fully penetrates all the retinal layers from intravitreal injection, that has rapid systemic elimination, that has a low potential for uh, cell or complement mediated cytotoxicity, and that binds to multiple uh, VEGF isoforms. And so we want a smaller molecular weight because we want it to get into the eye, get out of the eye, and then get into the systemic circulation, and that's super important. Also, we want a drug that has a high affinity for the VEGF isoforms that we're looking to block. So when I thought about this, I wanted to design something where we would have a roadmap where we could stop at different waypoints and talk about why we do what we do, why we think about the way we think, and how to get to the basic endpoint. And the endpoint that we want to get to, and our destination today, is the successful resolution of type 1 ROP. In other words, no progression to stage 4 or 5, with the caveat that we don't want to cause any damage from what we're doing systemically. So here's a bunch of supporting articles, and you can pull this up later because this is a recorded um, a recorded lecture and you can have these are excellent articles. Some of them are a little bit older. Some of them are brand new just a few months ago. So something definitely to look at and pull up and use. So our first roadmap, and this is what I talk to, um, to my neonatologists about all the time. And this was pioneered by Shukla and then also uh, um, uh, the folks at Cleveland Clinic. Um, talking about biphasic oxygen distribution. And we had stop rock before, which wasn't really effective, but these more recent papers have shown great effectivity of controlling biphasic oxygen distribution. One of the things that you have to have for biphasic oxygen distribution is an oxygen blender. And many of our other countries that don't have the availability of blenders have high rates of uh, ROP or oxygen-induced retinopathy because the only way you can deliver oxygen to a baby is through the nasal cannula and the wall oxygen. You can't blend it 
with um, the, the air and have a decreased uh, sat rate. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But Jonathan Sears and Shukla really did a good job with our paper, and we'll talk about that here. Um, when we talk about the ROP, it's important to understand that there's two phases to ROP. One is the hyperoxic phase, and this leads to retinal vascular growth, attenuation, and vasoobliteration. In other words, the vessels just stop growing. And so at that time early, and this is when the baby's born to about 33 or 34 weeks, we keep the saturation rate between 88 and 92%. And that's, of course, individualized for every baby. And this is really in control of, of our neonatologists, who I love to work with. Um, and then the phase two is a hypooxic phase, where you have pathologic angiogenesis in response to overexpression of the cytokines. In other words, the VEGF rises. And so we want a higher sat rate at that time to downregulate everything. And what I do the paper's complicated, but what I do in order to make it easy for me is that any time I see any stage two or beginning vascular tortuosity, I know the VEGF levels are up. I'll ask my neonatologists to raise the SAT rates to 96 to 99. You don't want to go over 99 because you want your, your, your um, alarm at 100 because if you go over 100, you don't really know how much um, saturated oxygen is in the baby system. And that way we can downregulate and we're just using oxygen basically as a drug and it works really, really well. And sometimes just like you would inject anti-VEGF, you'll see regression of the ROP that you had seen previously by using this type model. They demonstrated in their parameters about greater than 50% reduction in type 1 ROP, treatable ROP using a biphasic model. Now, in their model, they actually turn up the oxygen saturation on all the babies they have. And we don't do that. We do, it's a more selective, um, um, selective method. And uh, we are collecting data on that. But it's my gut that this is doing a really good job in helping us have less treatable type 1 ROP. Our second waypoint, we know that bevacizumab, the drug that's most commonly used, at the dose most commonly used, significantly reduces plasma VEGF in premature infants after intravitreal injection. And this was done and shown in retina in 2015. And, uh, and you know, there were 11 eyes from six infants who received intravitreal injections. And we, they looked at the plasma concentrations of VEGF, what's measured in the serum. And it's very difficult to measure in the serum accurately. But they did feel that the plasma concentration of VEGF didn't return to original levels in the samples until eight weeks after the injection. So that's something important to think about. And if you only have a vastin to use as a drug, then that's what you have to use as a drug. But it's something to consider for the future and something to push your people for to be able to obtain other drugs as they come out in the near future. We want normal VEGF levels in these infants so their other organs and other systems can grow. So the RAINBOW trial was a trial that was done using um, Lucentis, which the results of which were published um, just a, a, a few months ago. Um, and um, 225 infants were enrolled, and there were 75 bilateral injections of 0.1 milligram of ranibizumab and 73 of 0.2 milligram. And then there were 69 bilateral retinal laser photocoagulations. And basically, they measured the VEGF levels, and they came to the conclusion that there's no significant difference in the plasma-free concentrations of VEGF between any groups or over time. In other words, it didn't matter whether you lasered or you used 0.2 or 0.1. There's no significant differences in plasma VEGF. So that may mean that it's really something important um, for the future of these kids. The median elimination time, and this is calculated on our computer model, was 5.6 days from the eye and 0.3 days from the serum. So our third waypoint, the neurodevelopmental effects of anti-VEGF treatment are still in question. And that's super important to recognize also. Um, it's very difficult to assess neurodevelopmental um, issues in children that are born premature because they have so many other things um, which um, they have challenges um, for. Um, but this was a, an article published in Pediatrics um, and they, they did compare the babies that had 
intravitreal bevacizumab versus laser treatments. And they looked at motor language and cognitive. And they said that the odds of the severe motor developmental skills, neurodevelopmental skills were 3.1 times higher in the Avastin group. It's a small chart review. This is limited, the study. There's some data was obtained from parental interviews, which is always not the best choice. The more infants in the bevacizumab group had zone one disease. In other words, they were probably sicker babies. And the scores were not calculated if the children were severely developmentally delayed. Um, the neurodevelopmental outcomes, uh, this is another study recently published in OSLI uh, by Dr. Grieve, um, where we, again, they looked at the uh, Bailey scores at two years, and the average Bailey scores for cognition, language, and motor did not differ between the groups. So we don't really know at this point what neurodevelopmental changes can occur with any of these drugs. There's a lot of literature. The RAINBOW trial actually is doing a prospective trial up to five years to look at this question also. And we won't have that data for a few years yet. We're at year four in that RAINBOW trial at this point, waiting for that data to come in. A waypoint number four. So this is super important. This is something that was uh, initially not recognized um, when the beat rap trial, which you all are familiar with, was done. But most infants, when they're injected with anti-VEGF, are peripherally avascular and are careful, require careful monitoring in perpetuity or, in our case, laser to the avascular area. The issue is when we first injected Avastin and you looked in there, it's very difficult to tell, especially when babies are more highly pigmented, where the demarcation area is between vascular and avascular retina. So when you started looking with fluorescent angiogram, you can actually see the demarcation lines. So um, that's something that we started to think about and have done some work on and published some papers. Um, we looked at, we did a retrospective evaluation, uh, including retcan fundus and fluorescent angiograms of 16 neonates who received ranibizumab for type one disease um, between April 13th April 2013 and January of 2015. We looked for maturity to zone three based on a standard ETROP definition, vascular blunting, vascular loops, vascular dilatation, capillary dropout, and vascular fluorescing leakage. Um, this is a case from one of those things, and this is a former 25-week-old male, 690 grams. At that time, we treated with 0.15 milligrams ranibizumab for top one ROP at about 37. We performed a fluorescent angiogram at 60 weeks. And this is what it looked like. And what you can see here is you see vascular fluorescein leakage at the edge. You can see this big swath of avascular retinas in both eyes. Um, and babies, unfortunately, at this point, the retina really, the blood vessels don't advance very much past this point. They have basically stopped growing, but that vascular leakage does indicate some um, activity and um, we don't know what that means for the future, but um, we'll talk about how to, how to mitigate risk, in my opinion. So you also see only growth to the anterior edge of zone two, not into zone three. A case study number two, this is a former 23-week-old male twin, 320 grams. He was treated with 0.15 milligrams of ranibizumab at 37. FA was performed at 99. This is when I was just first starting to perform FA, so some, uh, we went back and picked up all these kids. That's why some are a little bit different of when we perform the FAs. Now I perform almost all FAs at 60 weeks if possible. So this is, remember, this is at 99 weeks, and you can see uh, there's only growth to the anterior edge of some too. You see some vascular loops as well. And then you can see some vascular fluorescein leakage indicating activity. In our results, we only had 50% of the eyes that actually reached zone three. In other words, the blood vessels only grew to zone three. 90% of the eyes had vascular blunting. 93.4 eyes had, percentage of the eyes had vascular loops. 40% had that vascular leakage. In other words, that little bit of activity. 90% of eyes had vascular dilatation, and 93.4% of eyes had a capillary dropout. And so our conclusion was that, um, that ranibizumab is effective for the initial cessation of type 1 ROP, but 
Full vascularization was only achieved in 50% of these babies, and the majority of eyes had some vascular anomalies. Um, what this does is necessitate long-term observation of the avascular peripheral retina. And if observation is not possible, consideration should be given to photocoagulation in these avascular areas. We know from looking at different studies, and my friend Manny Chang is looking at this, where you have children that have been injected with anti-VEGF, and if you look at them as teenagers, many of them have some abnormalities such as last degeneration, retinal tears, and even retinal detachments. So waypoint number five uh, is that premature infants who develop ROP are more likely to have an FCD4 variant, which may predispose them to peripheral retinal vascular anomalies. You're all familiar with FCD4 and other um, uh, genetic anomalies like T-SPAN 12, which are associated with fever or familial exudative vitreo retinopathy. This is a pediatric retinal disease characterized by the appearance of an ROP-like syndrome in the absence of premature birth that can cause devastating blindness and can be active throughout life. The wind signaling is the ubiquitous pathway that modulates cellular and tissue differentiation. And in regards to eye development, the particular wind pathway, the Norin FZD4, has been identified as playing a role. And unfortunately, a disproportionate percentage of infants and children with the diagnosis of ROP or fever have the FZD4 variant, and 7.5% um, in the ROP population compared with the general population. And this study was performed by Kim Drenzer at, uh, at Royal Oak. More recently, in the Journal of Ophthalmology in 2020, they looked at uh, many uh, children, and they found nine infants with fever-related eye disease causing gene mutations that had ROP. Um, in the 18 eyes of these nine patients, nine of the eyes exhibited severe ROP. So in conclusion, the LRP5, FCD4, NDP, and T-SPAN12 may play a role in the pathogenesis of ROP and can cause atypical ROP or preterm familial exudative vitreo retinopathy. The fundus lesions of ROP patients with disease-causing gene mutations are more serious and may be fever combined with ROP, ROPER, as defined by um, uh, Nina Barakal. So it's important to realize that even though you may not know and you may not have the genetic ability to test for this, if you inject a baby with ROP and they have one of these genes, it may put them at risk in the future for neovascularization. So again, consider lasering the periphery. And laser of the periphery in these babies, and we can talk about this a little bit, is not like confluent laser as we would treat a type 1 ROP. Um, Polycurum has recently um, published a paper showing that um, we don't have to have confluent laser. It's more non-confluent, more PRP laser. But I would advocate fairly heavy laser up against the vascular, avascular zone, as that's where we know that the VEGF is produced. And again, um, these FCD4 and ROP and other genes, if an infant has this genetic anomaly and has been treated for type 1 ROP, is, is he or she at risk for reactivation after anti-VEGF treatment? And the answer is, at this point, nobody really knows, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind always. So waypoint number six, premature infants injected with anti-VEGF drugs Bevacizumab, varanabizumab may reactivate and develop retinal detachments. Super important to know. It is not a one and done phenomenon. It doesn't work like that. Just like in your diabetic patients or your macular generation patients, um, these drugs will bind to the, um, to the protein VEGF, but then they fall off. More VEGF is produced and babies can reactivate. <clears throat> we know from <clears throat> in 2018, Dr. Gunakawa's patient that progressive retinal detachments can occur in this condition. Their fibrovascular contraction and traction retinal detachments are recognized complications associated with the use of these drugs. And so I'll show you some pictures. This was an international multicenter interventional retrospective case series. 35 eyes with retinal detachments and 23 infants were included. 
Inclusion required the antivascular um, VEGF factor treatment for type 1 ROP with progression to traction retinal detachments. These are pictures from Dr. Yonakawa's paper. Um, and as you know, as you all know, these are very, very difficult to fix once these do occur. So my case, this is a former 23 week old, 33 and uh, three, three seventh week old infant who was injected three times elsewhere with bilateral intravitreal avastin. It was first seen by me at age 59 weeks of age. And you can see um, what's happened uh, since the injection. So in other words, it can recur, you need to pay attention. And if it does recur or you start to see, you have the options of treating with another anti-VEGF, but um, you know, laser is definitive and it works well. And once the babies have grown out of zone one, then laser is probably the most appropriate treatment in my hands at this point. In other words, this one unfortunately required vitrectomy. This was the other eye, which had a stage five retinal detachment at this point. So case number two is a former 24 week old infant injected four times with bilateral intravitreal bevacizumab elsewhere and was first seen by me at 18 months of age. And the right eye was already tysical with a funnel uh, 5B retinal detachment. And the left eye, uh, fortunately, still had an ATATS retina. And you can see the abnormalities of the vascular centrally in this uh, left macula. And you can see the activity on the edge. And I lasered this extensively. And you can see the regression, uh, which occurred in the color photograph on the right. And we fortunately were able to help this child. Waypoint number seven. The combined treatment with ranibizumab and laser alone is effect or laser alone is effective in treating micro premature infants uh, less than 750 grams with type 1 ROP. We really want to look at um, small babies, in other words, less than 750 grams. Not everyone has these babies, but this is something we were really um, interested to see um, what our results were when we went back and looked at all the babies that we had seen who were super small. And as you know, the smaller the babies are, the higher the percentage of folks um, that get type 1 ROP are. And as you see from the photographs on the bottom, this was a previously anti-VEGF treated eye. I think this was treated by my partner, Dr. Ryan Young on the right with beautiful laser. So um, this was a 23 week old, four sevenths male, 550 grams, 35 weeks, and then 42 weeks. I had intravitreal ranibizumab, and our dose at that time was 0.15 milligrams. And a lot of times, and um, you will always see this, and Tony Capone will always talk about flat neovascularization occurring in, in uh, zone one. Super important to pay attention to that. It's not going to look like a stage three normally. So if you see that, that remember to put in your mind that flat neovascularization can be awful as well and will cause really severe problems if you, if you don't laser it or treat it appropriately. Um, this was the FA at 50 weeks. Uh, and again, this is that same laser on the right that uh, my partner, Dr. Ryan Young, did to um, save this child. And really, this is still in zone one. And this was after a couple injections of anti-VEGF. Some babies are so sick and if they continue to be sick, they're going to have sick retinas as well, and you have to treat that appropriately. So we did a retrospective re review, and we looked at um, 100 babies. These were less than 750 grams. The time to regression was uh, defined clinically. And at that time, we used 0.15 milligrams of uh, ranibizumab. I've subsequently gone to 0.2 milligrams based on the results of the rainbow trial. Anyway, we had 100 neonates, 63% were male, um, 597 grams was the mean birth weight from 310 to 750, and the mean gestational age was 24.2 weeks. Our results, and remember I was lasering more at this time, we had 100 neonates, 40 neonates developed type 1 ROP, 40%, so pretty high at that time. Um, we did 21 uh, just regular laser, and 19 we did a random visit map followed by 19 lasers at 60 
uh, 60 weeks of age if possible. I choose 60 weeks because at that time, the lungs have matured really well. Um, the anesthesiologist usually will let them go home from the hospital on the same day, um, which is super important. Um, and we feel like the retinas stopped growing at that point, so the laser can take care of the rest that where the vessels haven't grown out to in the avascular area. So our comorbidities that we looked at, uh, we wanted to look at that as well. There's no correlation between the incidence of systemic comorbidities and ROP, but there were a lot of comorbidities. And these are the ones that we usually expect. And by the way, many of these things can be partially resolved by using the appropriate oxygen levels in the NICU. None of our patients progressed to stage four or five, 100% success in that way. Um, and this is what we're effectively looking for, and this is why we do it the way we do it. Um, there was no correlation of systemic comorbidities. We, uh, they did have a high rate of ROP at this time, and the use of peripheral ablative laser still, with or without ranibizumab, was able to prevent progression past stage three in all cases. No infants progressed to stage four or five. And on the right, um, on your right of your screen, this is Waylon. This was that 320 gram gram baby that we uh, treated. So waypoint number eight, this is a safer technique and I'm gonna talk about this. We published this in a paper in OSLI. The safer technique um, uh, for the treatment of type one ROP minimizes risk and really optimizes the outcome. And we were trying to develop a technique where um, we could allow everyone to take care of these babies super safely. So the injection of intraventral anti-VEGF necessitates a practical technique that is dependable and standardized in order to help ensure the safest outcome possible. And so we put it all together. The short needle, 32 gauge, four millimeter needle. Um, we found this needle um, because the original needles that were used were very long, uh, 7.9, eight millimeter needle. Now, if you take a needle like that, you can put it all the way across the baby's eye, you can put it through the lens, and you can cause a lot of damage if you sink it all the way to the hub. So there had to be a better way to do this. So uh, we found a four millimeter needle that we've subsequently used, and I'll, I'll show you the manufacturer of that needle. Um, and we looked, uh, Linda Chernchiaro uh, wrote a paper and looked at 220 um, uh, injections, and it was a multi-center retrospective trial. When we look at where we inject the needle, you can inject, you cannot inject it at three to four millimeters as you would an adult eye because the baby's anatomy is completely different. Um, we know from um, looking at an aura nomogram from Annie Chang that we, we need to inject the babies about 0.75 to one millimeter from the limbus. At that point with this needle, it's very difficult to uh, have any complications, and we'll talk about that. So we use an antiseptic or antibiotic. There have been reports in the literature. There's even one in the rainbow trial where they had um, endophthalmitis um, from injection uh, after, you know, for type 1 ROP. We use betadine uh, 10%. I leave it on the eye for about five minutes. And then after the injection, I apply betadine. Again, I don't um, use antibiotics for the antibiotic uh, prophylactic part. I will use an antibiotic uh, steroid combination afterwards just because the betadine itself is so caustic. But um, betadine has been around for a long time and is a great drug uh, and works well for us in preventing any, air, any, any um, cases of endophthalmitis. The F in SAFER uh, is super important. Um, if you inject an adult, we know that adults will tell us if they have pain in their eye or they can't see or anything like that, they're gonna call our office or come back into your office and say, hey, this is not working for me, something's going on. So if they get an infection, they know. Babies can't tell you that. About the only thing that can happen is, is that they can develop a fever, or they'll get fussy and they won't eat, but some of them are on parenteral feeds in the NICU. So it's very important that you go back to the NICU in 48 to 72 hours to make sure no infection has occurred. So E is stands for extra attention to detail. We use sterile instruments. We use the oronomogram that I described earlier. 
and we look for the presence of conjunctivitis. If the baby has conjunctivitis, you should not be treating at that time. You need to start them on um, some antibiotics and make that clear, or um, alternatively, you would perform laser at that time. And then we recheck every one to two weeks following anti-VEGF. And then um, we don't do flourishing angiogram every one to two weeks, but we do do it between 60 to 65 weeks on every baby that I treat with intravitreal anti-VEGF. Rechecking every one to, two, one to two weeks can ensure that you don't miss anything and have a recurrence. Um, if there's anything active, in other words, if I see anything that is just not plain avascular with stage zero ROP, I come back every week and see these kids and they come to my office every week um, until they're ready for surgery um, at 60 weeks. A 60 week old baby, I, I have that also because babies at that point are very difficult to examine. So it's super important that those babies are looked at. Here's the little needles from TSK and you can see the size of that needle. Um, I put this box on there, so if anybody wants to order them, they can, they can do that. So the background of the SAFER technique, and, the, and we talked about this a little bit, the Beat Rock 2011, it was a 7.93 millimeter. Even in the Rainbow trial, it was a 12.7 millimeter needle. Those are absolutely huge needles to use in these babies. Um, the gauges are a little different. We use the 32 um, and when we look at the literature, we don't find any evidence that uh, there's any less um, endophthalmitis in adult patients with a smaller gauge needle, whether it's a 30, 31, or 32. I do think that a 32 gauge needle in an adult causes less discomfort, and I kind of use that for my technique for babies as well and when I think about that. And the Rainbow Study trial is, is published at this point. So in 2017, Lauren Wright described the technique um, with intravitreal injection and with this 32 gauge four millimeter needle with a concomitant pathology. Um, we, uh, she took a, um, an autopsy uh, infant eye and a 56 week old, and we looked at it with a 12 millimeter needle and it could penetrate the lens or retina, go all the way across the other side of the eye. So it really gave us an idea of what this you know, really looked like inside the eye. However, the four millimeter needle, as you can see on your right, super small. <clears throat> it's very difficult to damage um, the eye with this needle. And it effectively penetrates the vit into the vitreous cavity. And as you uh, well know, um, these needles, uh, the, the sclera at this point is about uh, a millimeter, 0.75 millimeters thick, so it's easy for the needle to get in there. So uh, Linda Chernichar uh, really wrote a great paper when she looked at a combination of all of our results along with uh, Baskin Palmer. And uh, we've used the short needle since 2014. Um, and these are all the centers that I see on the right. We see in uh, Austin 550 new babies a year. And Baskin Palmer sees a huge amount of babies as well. And the type one ROP we treated with the 32 gauge four millimeter needle. And you can see how small that needle is. It's a single use hypodermic sterile. And again, 0.15 to 1.5 millimeters from the limbus, depending on the patient's chronological age. <clears throat> Sorry. And the results of the demographics, Baskin Palmer, um, they had um, the gestational age and our gestational age was almost exactly the same the birth weight in grams. Uh, they're a little smaller in Baskin Palmer and injected a little bit later. And they injected Avastin <clears throat> and we inject Ranibizumab. Well, we had no complications in any of the groups from cataract and the minus vitreous hemorrhage or anything else, uh, vitre or uh, retinal detachments. So this is the first time demonstrating the safety of the 32 gauge needle. It, the, the benefit it offers is small eyes. It's lower risk of iatrogenic breaks and a lower risk of lenticular energy. So when we talk about antibiotics, um, you can use five to 10% betadine. Most of the time, <clears throat> the betadine comes as a 5%. I use 10% just because I worry. 
and you consider, consider the antibiotic steroid again to decrease the inflammation secondary to antiseptic. Prevention of infection during this procedure is paramount. It's super important. Topical betadines used for almost 40 years remains the most effective bactericidal agent. Following the um, 48, 72 hours, you've got to look. Babies, again, can't tell you whether they get an infection, so it's super important to know um, if they do. And then here's our setup. <clears throat> here's what it looks like. We don't use this light to assess where the aura is. I'm just giving you an example of this on the right. But here's the setup that we use in general. We use masks as well. Of course, everybody's using masks for everything. And then we recheck them one to two weeks following treatment, and we perform our fluorescent angiogram at 60 to 65 weeks in the operating room under general anesthesia. And again, recurrence can occur, we know, up to five years later, so it's super important to pay attention. Um, <clears throat> here's our ROP injection video. <clears throat> and um, now what we also do with this, um, uh, when we use this technique, I'll put a little towel over the nose and over the mouth to prevent um, particulate from heading up that way. And then we also place another drop of betadine in the baby side. And you can see, play it one more time, you can see that little short needle there <clears throat> in this little syringe. So the destination is the successful resolution of type 1 ROP. No progression of stage 4 or 5. There's a call to action, and this is not the end of the story. This is how I do it. You have to use what you do. And if you're successful with the technique that you use, then by all means, continue that way. Um, but there are many, many babies in the world that are going blind from ROP, and our goal is to, is to cause resolution and make that happen for people. We want that to go away. We are, um, through my, our nonprofit, Small World Vision, working on oxygen blenders in order to provide a more reasonable cost basis for a blender that can get them help these, um, help these NICUs and help these babies survive and thrive. Here's a, more references if you're interested to getting to the end. <clears throat> and then I really want to thank um, all of you for listening this morning. Here's my email if you'd like. I'd also like to uh, thank... Um, Jessica Goldstein, my assistant, for really helping me put this whole thing together and really uh, collecting all this data. So we have a few questions, uh, and um, I don't use bevacizumab. Uh, the first question is, do you use bevacizumab and what dose? Um, most people use uh, 0.625 bevacizumab, um, and um, that has been super successful for almost all people. There recently has been a de-escalation trial using very micro doses of um, uh, bevacizumab, but it has a 40% failure rate and they had several retinal detachments and even a cataract. So I would caution the use of very micro doses of bevacizumab. And again, I don't use bevacizumab, so I don't prepare it by myself. Also with microdosing, it's very difficult because you'd have to develop it under the hood and the risk of infection is very high. So I, certain, I certainly would not um, uh, do that. Next question is, for how long do you follow the babies treated with anti-VEGF? And we follow the babies, again, to 60 weeks. And then I, um, take the, um, I take them to the OR and do that. Um, and treat them with a laser. Following that, I'm a retina surgeon, so I'm certainly, my refraction is lights on and lights off, so I send them to the pediatric ophthalmologist, um, my great colleagues, to take care of them for their refractions if they have any. Recently, we've done um, some a trial and submitted a paper where we actually looked at the refractive errors for treatment with lucentis followed by laser, and we found that we had no refractive errors compared to the average. So it does work well in allowing the anterior segment to develop. The recurrence, uh, one question is, what is the recurrence rate after bevacizumab versus ranibizumab? Um, the recurrence rate in general, if you look at the studies, is a little bit higher with ranibizumab. Um, it may be dose-related. We don't really know. Um, I personally don't have a higher 
recurrence rate with ranibizumab, especially at the 0.2 dose of ranibizumab. Bevacizumab, again, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the best dose is. Um, yeah, next question is, is there any development of macular edema as a complication of laser-treated babies? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and they do develop macular edema, but it almost all resolves spontaneously. Um, if you treat too heavily with laser, and that's an important thing to talk about, um, you sometimes will get exudative detachments, and then we have to give them systemic steroids to allow that to re uh, resolve. And so um, it's important to treat where you have, uh, if you're treating an initial baby with type 1 or OP, you want to use confluent laser, and you don't want a bright white spot, you want a more gray spot, because remember, those will light up later and become more confluent, but it needs to be near confluent, um, kind of a gray spot, not white, and you'll avoid uh, the amount of macular edema that you're talking about. Um, I do think the macular edema resolves very quickly. I don't think it's going to result in any amblyopia. And again, there's some, been some good studies out of Duke uh, and looking at the OCT changes after laser. Um, the ROP patients, uh, why are they myopic? Um, premature babies um, in general um, tend to be more myopic than the average um, term babies. That's one thing. Second thing, if you laser heavily and uh, posteriorly for type 1 ROP, the anterior segment in these babies is not the right um, shape and it causes a myopia. Um, do you treat type 1 ROP? That's an excellent question. Um, we treat all babies with type 1 ROP. That's the definition of ETROP. And if you see it, you need to treat it. Um, there are some cases of type 2 ROP that's persistent. And Edward Wood from Stanford is looking at this question, trying to figure out which of these we need to treat. But there are some with persistent neovascularization that I will treat with type 2. It's pretty rare that we do that, though. But there are some... I have a feeling that some of these babies may have maybe a roper baby. In other words, have the um, genes for fever as well. <clears throat> Not sure about that, but I have a feeling that is the case. They're a little bit different. Also, there can be asymmetric babies with that fever gene that require treatment. What is the safe measurements um, for giving anti-VEGF and ROP and neonates? Well, there's, I guess, two of things. One is where do you inject? And that's a about a millimeter from the limbus. And then the, uh, the dosages, one of the things that's difficult is the dosages are very difficult to see in a normal one cc syringe. Uh, and that's always been a source of frustration for everyone. So we're trying to develop a new, um, a new uh, syringe that has a, a much smaller barrel, but that's been very difficult so far, but we're trying to do that as well. Um, for type one, for stage three, zone three ROP, when do you treat it? Well, I mean, <clears throat> it depends. If you have the definition of type one ROP, which is any vascular tortuosity um, with um, a stage three, then you treat it. If you can't follow this baby anymore and you have stage three, zone three, then it probably should be treated. I would caution you at treating with anti-VEGF late because you can develop a crunch phenomenon. So at that point, laser may be your best option. You're not going to induce myopia when it's out in uh, stage three. The vast majority of ROP, remember, goes away. So it does resolve by itself. Almost all of it resolves. Out of all the babies we see, the 550 new babies a year, um, we only treat about 3% of those babies. And those are all the babies less than 1,500 grams. So it's um, it's something that um, the, to consider as well. This is rare that we end up treating them, but when we do, this is the information I'm giving you. Um, uh, do you ever inject anti-VEGF and laser at the same time? So I don't usually do that. Um, I think that if you inject anti-VEGF, well, there's two reasons. One is it works really well um, to get rid of that initial ROP. And then secondarily, I worry because if you place laser at the same time, it's going to egress into the system uh, circulation much faster because you've disrupted that barrier, which allows it to stay in the vitreous cavity. So I don't usually do that. Um, uh, have you ever 
injected more than once for, uh, for um, in babies. And yes, um, it is rare, but babies sometimes can be so sick that there's no way that they can undergo general anesthesia. And that one baby that I showed you the picture of, um, he was injected twice with Lucentis, but he had severe disease. He was an IUGR kid and was super small at 320 grams. So when you see a baby like that, you need to really confer with your neonatologist and figure out what's going on with the baby systemically. Because if they have, if they have lung problems, if they have gut problems, if they've had neck, if any of those things are happening, you should be on alert for the development of ROP. In addition, you all know the WinRop study. If your babies are falling off the growth curve, they're gonna develop ROP. So it's super important to pay attention to all the systemic parameters of going on with every baby. And every time you see the babies in the NICU, you need to sit down with your neonatologists and have a conference and figure out what's going on and be able to tell them so that they can communicate to the parents what's going on with the baby every time. Is there any evidence of systemic effects of, of anti-VEGF? And the question is, the jury is still out. We still don't really know. Um, we know that, for instance, that um, we have seen evidence that the dose of bevacizumab that's currently used by most people does cause some systemic suppression of serum um, anti-VEGF. But, um, and we know that from the rainbow trial, they did not see any um, serum anti-VEGF um, uh, suppression. So, or serum VEGF suppression. So it's super important to pay attention to that. And I think We'll know in the future, but we're not really sure quite yet. Um, and the question is, is that do you give laser treatment as first-line therapy at all? And I will do that sometimes. It depends. Sometimes some of our kids, um, I know that I may lose them. They may leave the country. Um, they may have a social situation where I'm worried. And I have to make a decision whether to give anti-VEGF or give laser, and I will do laser. In addition, if a baby is older, and I already know the baby's retinas have grown out pretty far in zone two, almost to zone three, but still need treatment, then laser is a good option for this baby, and if they're healthy enough for the general anesthetic. You can do laser without general anesthetic, but I like airway control. I don't like to have to rapidly intubate somebody or have the the fellows do that because it, it, it is uh, very distressing to the baby and to everybody around. So I do like airway control. It is doable. There was a study that was shown that if you do intubate and have control, you'll do a little bit better job with the laser. Um, and there are other anti-VEGFs um, that are coming on the market. Um, there is a uh, Regeneron is, uh, is, has a trial using, um, ILEA uh, in a very small dose, and that one is ongoing. And there's other uh, Convercept, which is used in, and not in the US, but in other countries such as China. Um, and there are other drugs in the, in the pipeline as well. So if ROP does not regress, how many times can you give intravitreal anti-VEGF? Super important question. Um, you know, the problem is you're, you're, you are, if you give more than one, you get to, you don't know what the systemic effect is. And that's a good follow-up question to the one we had. So if I'll give one and it recurs, and usually it'll regress, but if it recurs, and remember, so for instance, in the one de-escalation trial, they only looked at the recurrence rate at four weeks. Well, any anti-VEGF when you inject won't recur usually at four weeks, unless you've missed the window of opportunity. But if it, they usually occur between six and eight weeks, which is when we know it wears off in adult eyes. So it's super important to pay attention. Um, and if you have a laser at that time, you have recurrence and the baby's retinas have grown, then it's time to do the laser. Um, and um, that's kind of where we are. Um, I haven't, have had no experience with ILEA injection. ILEA is something again, which is investigational. Um, and that will be uh, probably looking at something for the future. It's a very small dose of uh, ILEA uh, that is uh, being used. Um, so follow up these patients. Basically, if you have an ROP kit, <clears throat> you need to follow up the patients forever because 
um, they're going to have risks of retinal detachment. Sometimes they have vitreous hemorrhages um, that occur at the, at the uh, avascular vascular junction. So it's important to have you or the pediatric ophthalmologist follow up with them for the rest of their lives. They're gonna need glasses, they're gonna need contact lenses sometimes when they're older. So um, it's super important. Uh, how many high-risk babies develop ROP? High risk in the sense of anybody less than 1,500 grams. Again, our rate is three or four percent. Some other countries we know. Um, uh, sometimes in other countries we can have rates up to 40 to 50 to 60 percent in babies that are much larger um, because of the um, because of the oxygen delivery systems that they have. Um, Anti-VEGF injection performed in the NICU or at the bedside? I usually perform them at the bedside in our institutions, but whatever people are comfortable with, I would be comfortable with. Um, our neonatologists are, are, they are excellent and we have a very good working relationship. And it is a topical procedure. You're using topical anesthesia for injection and, and pretty, pretty simple. Um, I use a lot of betadine. Um, and the topical anesthesia, sometimes they give them a little versed, but usually we don't give them anything just like what you would do in your clinic. Um, ROP occurs, I would encourage you to look at the early treatment for retinopathy or prematurity study. That's the classification that we use. Um, and it's an excellent study and an excellent thing. But basically, if you have plus disease uh, in any stage two or stage three, then you need to uh, treat. Um, the uh, plus disease also can look like if you have a baby with pulmonary hypertension, you can get some vascular uh, tortuosity. So you need to differentiate that from that. Um, is there any reason to measure IOP and anti-VEGF and what is the reason? Um, I don't measure interocular pressure. We do look at the optic nerve to see if there's pulsation. Um, I think it's very difficult because the baby's squeezing and you'll have the lid speculum in there. So to get an accurate reading, after injections, very, very difficult. And I answered this question, do you perform anti-VEGF with local anesthesia or sedation? Um, it's just topical. Um, and again, if it, the neonatologist wants to give them Versed, then, then they can do that. I always have the charge nurse and usually will have the respiratory therapist standing by uh, these babies uh, to resuscitate if necessary, but I can't remember when we've ever had that happen before. Um, do babies have vessels in zone three, almost till the aura with leakage need treatment? That's a very good question. Um, I think if you're within a disc diameter, if you have leakage and you have leakage, you can see that on fluorescent angiogram. I think you need to treat it. If it's just a vascular and you're within a disc diameter of the aura, you're probably going to be okay. You can place some light laser since you're there anyway. And again, I think these babies later will develop some thinning of the retina and, um, and possibly lattice. So you need to consider that. We don't really know yet, but this is what we do to be super safe. So according to your experience, which causes more myopic eyes between babies treated with anti-VEGF only or laser only? Um, that's already, that's really been answered in the literature and laser definitely causes more myopia um, than the anti-VEGF injections. Um, and again, when I looked at my data, looking at anti-VEGF plus laser later, uh, we don't have any induced myopia. Stage four, do you use anti-VEGF? No, if you develop stage four and you have traction, you need to do a tractomy. That's the only way you're going to rescue that. Um, and I worry about the traction in that case, again, causing crunch, pulling that um, traction off. Please share the laser parameters. Um, this is difficult because all lasers are a little bit different. Um, the lasers are, um, you have a newer laser, you have to use less power. If you have a highly pigmented baby's retina, use less power because the laser spot's gonna be a little hotter. Um, so you have to be careful. And again, it's titrated to a gray spot. I use the 28 diopter lens. Um, we use a 100 millisecond interval. Um, and then you probably need to put at least 1500 spots uh, in, um, uh, in, this, in the baby. Um, I don't avoid the horizontal refe because that is the area of most activity in general. 
And if you avoid that, you are setting yourself up for a little bit of a disaster because that's where the recurrence rate can occur. I don't have any experience using biosimilars in babies, um, only in um, only in adults uh, in uh, investigational trials. Anyway, thank you all so much. Um, and if you have any other questions, um, please um, don't hesitate in contacting us. Um, I'm happy to answer and happy to be of help to anything that uh, anybody in the community is. And thank you so much to my staff and thank you uh, to Lawrence, um, who's our techs uh, extraordinaire for CyberSight. Thank you so much, appreciate it.